Coming up, Governor Bashir is preparing for what could be the most hotly contested election of the year. Dedicated to Eastern and Southern Kentucky, this is WYMT Mountain News at 11. Good evening, I'm Steve Hensley. The Kentucky governor's race this fall is expected to draw a lot of attention. Daniel Cameron will try to unseat one of the nation's most popular governors in Andy Bashir. Bashir also has a high approval rating among Kentuckians, but opponents say he has his weaknesses. WYMT's Bill Pendleton spoke to people on both sides of the debate on this closely watched race. Tonight, there is optimism that Andy Bashir will be seen as the favorite to win a second term in office in the November election. I don't, I don't foresee this as, as much of a challenge. I think he is so beloved in this state. His popularity numbers are through the roof. He's the most popular Democratic governor in the United States right now. From COVID to tornadoes to flooding and jobs, supporters say Bashir has a lot in his corner. But Republicans say there's cracks in his armor that show weak leadership. And they expect Daniel Cameron to focus on that. There's a, a whole line of kind of uh, weak leadership that goes through Andy Bashir's story, uh, keeping the schools closed longer than necessary, the unemployment insurance debacle, juvenile justice. And one of the reasons why so much attention is being focused on Kentucky's governor's race is that it's only one of three states with a governor's race this fall. And there have been a lot of questions of what happens this year will transfer to what happens next year in the U.S. presidential race. Will it be a litmus test of trends that could sweep the nation? And both parties want to have the talking point of we just won a big election in Kentucky heading into the presidential election next year and heading into the fight for Congress next year. We'll continue to bring it back to the kitchen table issues that matter to Kentuckians, things like jobs, things like making sure that we recruit and retain the best public school teachers for our state. Jacqueline Coleman will continue to be the lieutenant governor candidate for Bashir. Cameron has until August 8th to name a running mate. In Frankfurt, Phil Pendleton, WYMT Mountain News. The fall race could be expensive. Bashir still has about $7 million in his war chest. Watson says Cameron spent a lot of money in the primary and will have to raise more for the general election. We still have full election results and reaction from candidates on WYMT.com. Now, as Phil just mentioned, one of Daniel Cameron's first decisions will be choosing a running mate. Previously, candidates had to run together from the time they announced, but the law was changed to allow a decision after the primary. That opens the door to potentially choosing a candidate who lost in the primary. Ryan Quarles came in second and showed he has strength in several parts of the state. He also indicated his time in public service won't end with yesterday's loss. Some other lawmakers have also been mentioned. The law requires a candidate for lieutenant governor to file by the second Tuesday in August. Well, a warm one around the region today. Also a much quieter one all throughout the region today. Just 24 hours removed from a couple of tornadoes that touched down in the mountains as we went through yesterday. We'll get to that a little bit later on, but a uh, look at the day that was today. We topped out near 80 in parts of the Cumberland Valley, middle and upper 70s out that way. Some of us stayed a little cloudier over in the portions of the Big Sandy and even into southwest Virginia where they have been in the upper 60s to near 70 today. It's all quiet, just some of that low-level moisture on pinpoint Doppler, so not a whole lot to talk about weather-wise tonight. Maybe a night to maybe crack the windows a little bit. How about upper 40s to low 50s as we wake up in the morning with beautiful sunshine quickly into the mid-50s and quickly we'll be getting to near 80 for a daytime high tomorrow, but the prospect of some showers trying to return, that's there, and I'm tracking them in a few minutes. Steve? Evan, thank you. The Louisville Orchestra is in eastern Kentucky, making its first stop on its tour across the state. WYMT's Jordan Mullins has more from the orchestra's first performance in Prestonsburg. On Wednesday, the Louisville Orchestra made its first stop on its In Harmony tour across Kentucky, performing at the Mountain Arts Center in Prestonsburg. What we're really doing out here is we're coming into communities that we don't get to see very often uh, in Louisville, and we're just sharing 
our passion for music with these communities who share their passion for music with us as well. Bringing free shows to communities across the Commonwealth, to folks who may have never had the opportunity to see a live orchestra. They were able to provide this for free all across the Commonwealth, and uh, that's, that's the added bonus. You know, folks, we hope to see some folks in this building that don't quite make it to the, to the Mountain Arts Center very much. Bringing in new sounds, and some familiar ones too. Being able to invite the orchestra in to bring in a, a new mixture of sounds for people to listen to I think is great, um, but I think a lot of people will also hear some of that traditional sounds. Lindsay Branson, a Hazard native, co-composed a piece for the orchestra's tour titled Home, aimed at representing the state and the region that she calls home. It is such an honor to be able um, to do this with the Louisville Orchestra and actually get to do it in my hometown and not have to drive out three, four hours to be able to do this. Bringing music to the mountains and across the state for all to enjoy. Such a great opportunity. The Louisville Orchestra will also make stops at Appalachian Wireless Arena in Pikeville tomorrow, Thursday, and at Harlan County High School on Friday. All shows begin at 7.30 p.m. and tickets are free at the door. Some good news for the police officer who was injured in that motorcycle crash in Laurel County last month. The Monticello Police Department posted on Facebook yesterday, Officer Jeremy Thompson was released from the Wayne County Hospital and will continue his recovery at home. Prior to being transferred to the hospital in Monticello, he was at UK Hospital for quite a while. Family and fellow officers say they want to thank everyone for the support and prayers they have received. The Pikeville Police Department took the day to recognize its fallen officers during National Police Week. A group of officers visited the grave sites of fallen officer Scotty Hamilton, who was shot in the line of duty in 2018, and Alonzo Robinson, who was killed in 1929, the 94th anniversary of his death being yesterday. The officers then placed a wreath on the county's fallen officer memorial outside the courthouse to recognize all of the local heroes killed in the line of duty. First responders across Kentucky have responded to a spike in overdose incidents in the last 24 hours, with several of those overdoses being in Madison and Laurel counties. That's according to Addiction Recovery Care, or ARC. We do not know what substances are to blame for the spike. Many first responders now carry Narcan with them at all times due to the dangers of fentanyl. The Mingo County, West Virginia Sheriff's Office is asking for your help to identify a driver of a Jeep. They say passed a stop school bus in Williamson yesterday. Mingo County Sheriff Joe Smith says the incident happened just before 8 a.m. in Williamson's East End neighborhood. The school district says it is standard procedure for the Sheriff's Office to investigate to determine the next steps. Anyone with information about this is encouraged to contact the Mingo County Sheriff's Office. The Jackson Police Department is now in a new building just down the street from the old location at City Hall. Police Chief Brian Haddock says they're going from a three-room department to now two stories. Mayor Laura Thomas says they've been working on this move for a few years and finally received grant funding from USDA Rural Development to make it happen. We're just so excited because we actually started this in 2019. And so just being able to open the doors for these guys that deserve their own space and have room and uh, they do a good job serving the public and this is National Police Week so uh, how appropriate that we're here and they are able to use this facility to better serve the public. Mayor Thomas says the grant from USDA was around $450,000 to help them get into this new building and they used other local funds to complete the rest saying they were able to get it done debt free. Those with the Southeast South Central Kentucky Educational Cooperative say the pandemic helped to amplify the mental health struggles of students across the region and now thanks to federal funding the co-op will have the means to help. The co-op recently received six million dollars from the U.S. Department of Education to identify the mental health needs of the schools within the districts they serve and to provide students with better access to mental health resources.
Our main goal, our main objective, is to build that sustainability within our districts, to help train those staff, train them up to the point where they're, they're able to deal with some of the um, training needs that aren't always something that's brought in to those mental health professionals into their scope of work. Those with the co-op say they will be partnering with local colleges to find those mental health professionals to work in the school setting. It will also help to provide funding to these schools to continue this work. One Pike County teacher is being celebrated for his innovation in education as he retires from his teaching position this year. The Pritchard Committee is working to highlight the importance of durable skills, the extra boosts students receive from teachers that they can take with them into the workforce. That's why the committee visited Dr. Haridas Chandran, a teacher at Belfry High School who has implemented many STEM programs at the school in his 23 years. So he's been on our radar for a while and he's a terrific example of what's possible all across the state of Kentucky. So we want to lift him up as an example for other educators and as an example for other school leaders and districts um, as to what's possible in their schools and supporting students for their future. For more information about the Meaningful Diplomas series and how educators can approach the idea, check out our website. With the school year coming to a close, many school districts will continue to feed students during the summer months. Perry County Schools will be hosting food programs at all of its schools in the county. Nutritionist Alexis Martin says the program will be eligible for children of all ages. Martin says along with daily meals for students, parents will be able to pick up meals for the entire week. They don't have to come out every day to get these meals. They can come out on Mondays, and we're actually going to be open until 530, and they can come and get these meals that will last them seven days. And then the following Monday, they can come back again and get them for another seven days. She says they've seen an increase in students needing such programs since the July flood. To find out if your di school district will have a summer food program, contact Food Services or the Board of Education in your district. Prince Harry and Meghan Markle say they were involved in a near catastrophic car chase with the paparazzi. And we continue to look back at a couple of tornadoes that touched down yesterday and what we've got on the way, the details on the way. You're going to be a mom and we're here to help every adorably tiny